Shalom, welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmer and together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. We have a very, very special guest with us, Mr. Philip Stack, the Assemblyman from Colony Schenectady and Niskayuna Phil. Can I call your first name? Phil. Absolutely. Welcome to the Jewish and View. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, yes, yes. Thank great you. to be back. We have a little bit of a different set from the last time you were here. We actually, <laughs> we're not on, in our chairs and ah, you know, this, is so, nice, yeah. this is nice so uh, how are you acclimating in your second great year uh, of your first term uh, great <laughs> I think that uh, it, you know I've learned an awful lot I think we uh, we've been able to start early with some of our budget concepts which was helpful and we have a, a press conference tomorrow oh. on a bill <laughs> that uh, would allow all municipalities to join county self-insured health plans so the the county wow. self-insured plans are much less expensive than the uh, private plans that the municipalities currently yeah. have well, we to talked buy. about that also last time in that you're paying more now for health insurance <laughs> well, than you were when you were a county legislator when i joined the state it was twice as much amazing yeah and then the state is big enough it should easily self-insure it's kind of strange so you're going to tell them how to do it well, uh, proposed. it works. We need to save the taxpayers money because, uh, as we know, yeah. people are struggling with uh, the, the high property taxes. But that in health the state. insurance lobby is very powerful. Well, actually, <laughs> a lot of our local health insurers have, have departments that do self insurance. So they, you still need a, uh, the health insurance company to handle the claims. Right. It's not as profitable a business for them because they don't get taken the premium dollars. Mm -hmm. But they do get paid for processing the and claims. You said that you were put on the health committee temporarily, but you're still on the health committee. Well, what happened was... So are you, are you there as a permanent member now? I am. Oh, uh, good. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I'm actually really pleased with that. I've always had an in interest in uh, health and health insurance, and now I'm on both health and, and insurance, insurance, which right? are it's a good combination. And I really enjoy working with the chairman, Dick Godfrey, who's mm -hmm. an expert on health policy. But, um, I'll tell him you said so. He'll be a guest. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and Dick's office is right next to mine, and their office is very helpful. He's, you know, if, he, I think he's the most senior member, so they have a lot to good advice to give. But um, what happened was, as you know, we had a number of assemblymen leave for a variety of reasons, and there, was a vacant, there were three vacancies on health. Right. I was appointed temporarily by Dick. Uh, mm -hmm. But the, the permanent appointments have to come from the speaker, so mm -hmm. I uh, was persistent in my request, and ultimately I was appointed to the health committee, which is unusual because mm -hmm. it's unusual uh, for a freshman member to be on that. Exactly, it's, it's a very important it's committee. A very yeah, it's prestigious actually committee. when we when we first came to the body, we were told that there were four committees freshmen couldn't be on: ways and means, education, rules, and health. Really. Yeah, well, ways and means does the budget. Rules allows bills to go to the floor. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously education is just such a critical issue right. in the state. It's one of the main things that we do in the assembly is focus on education. Well, you, the health committee is 26 members, and you're the only freshman Democrat. Right, so I'm very pleased with that appointment. And then you're also on the insurance committee, which is also a prestigious committee. It's 25 members, and you're one of two freshman Democrats, same as the Transportation Judiciary Committee, which you and one other freshman Democrat sits on. Right. So that's, again, you're of the elite, because we've oh. had other freshmen. I wouldn't say we've that, had but, other freshmen but I have here. good committee assignments. Yeah, you do, I'm you very really do. So. They always talk about when you first get there, it's like the first year is just the learning. How much, I mean, again, that makes it even more important that you dove right into major well, committees, but how much can you really accomplish in the first year? Maybe I think in the first year, we had a great first year. Um, we had... Getting involved with the Health Committee allowed me to do a bill uh, that was supported by the Funeral Directors Association concerning having all uh, death certificate work processed electronically. They used to have to run back and forth to doctor's offices, town clerks, here, there, everywhere. And so we were able to get that passed. Um, I also had a bill that um, uh, we had a problem in the city of Schenectady where a number of the 
uh, churches had actually lost their tax-exempt status. And we were able to, I drew a bill that would, what happened was the city was selling tax liens to a private company. Liens were erroneously put on certain church property. So they were then sold to a private entity which was attempting to enforce those liens. And what we did was um, we uh, drafted legislation to amend the original legislation retroactively to make all not for all tax exempt properties maintain their tax exempt status as of the date the legislation was passed. So we, we tried to get specific uh, uh, mm -hmm. exemptions for the individual churches involved. That didn't work, so we went with that approach. Uh, and it got signed into law? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep, Good. so we've had a few. So you already have a certificate a, on your wall already? I think I got five bills passed. I, I was a also was the only freshman co-sponsor of the SAFE Act. I think the assembly leadership, that was a hot issue yeah. in my election. We had a very contested election in the 110th mm -hmm. district, and I've always been a gun control advocate, so uh, I took a lot of heat for that in the election, but I think the, our polling showed uh, <laughs> that in my district, gun control is, is uh, supported by the electoral, by a good margin, and I of think... Of your constituents. Right, yeah. and we... But you um, don't always put your finger up in the air no, to no, see no, where the wind is blowing. No, no, I took that before we had the polling. It just coincidentally that There were a were number of issues line. like that. What yeah. happens when you do polling is that when you meet with the pollster, they'll talk about what they think they want to poll on, and, and I would say, I think we ought to poll on this, and the standard... Conventional wisdom is stay as far away from that issue as possible, but in fact, the, um, I asked them to poll on it. They did, and the polling showed that, that I was correct. I, I think I have a pretty good insight into my uh, constituency. I mean, I, I spent mm -hmm. almost my entire life living in the town of Colony, so, um, Who but I'm not always know? right. I mean, the town, uh, my oh, district yeah. voted against casinos. I did vote for the governor's casino bill, which I... Mm -hmm. Reminded the governor of the other day because <laughs> uh, he and I have not seen eye to eye on a number of things. But I think that for Schenectady, um, Nis a casino mm -hmm. could be helpful. Obviously, Colony and Niskeyuna are an appropriate Let me ask you location. two things. Do you, so you hire pollsters just for your district? Yes. What who, they yeah. do, who when, do, who when do you get use? working with the Democratic Assembly oh. Campaign Committee, they have a pollster that they used okay. for the races that they feel are going to be hotly contested. Who, who do you gear it to your area? I can't remember the name of the oh, firm. Okay. So, and also, the second question, when you talk to the governor, is this a private meeting? or I mean, and how often do you uh, um, We don't meet one-on-one -on -one with the governor, but the governor was kind enough to meet with all the um, assembly. We had breakfast with the governor, all four of the... Uh, assembly members from the capital district and also we had a number of members um, one from Utica, Watertown, mm -hmm. Binghamton uh, who were also at that meeting so there's probably one that I've forgotten with apologies but it, the governor was very relaxed and we had an excellent discussion of, of policy issues and uh, I, I appreciated the governor listening to our views, even if we don't necessarily agree on everything, but I thought it was very, very gracious of him to do. And uh, what did you think of this uh, Common Core? Uh, we hadn't talked about Well, that. the Common Core is, is this an interesting thing. I think people generally, and I do, support the Common Core as a curriculum uh, designed to raise standards uh, for students in our schools. Where the problems come in is with the testing regime, where they're always testing kids over and over and over and over again, not really for educational purposes, but to measure teacher performance. I think the parents can't stand the testing, the students don't like it, and, and in uh, meeting with the Commissioner of Education, again, as part of the Democratic majority in the Assembly, I stress the point that uh, what makes for good students is people who love to learn and love being educated and when you're being tested all the time that's not going to happen so I, I don't think that's a good road for the state to go down 
Um, but the curriculum itself, you know, the, uh, as with any curriculum, you're always going to work your way through through some issues that might not have turned out as you planned. But but the testing regime is what people find most offensive. Also, students with disabilities were being given the same, you know, mm -hmm. learning disabilities were being given the same tests, which is possible for some, but not for all. Right, so it was and inappropriate. Yeah. It wasn't really appropriate, and the families were very upset because, uh, you know, the students were not reacting well. To so them. they're going to just tune up the Common Core? I mean, just to... I think they're going to delay it. Uh, well, you're calling for a moratorium. Well, the assembly already passed it, and I think the governor is in agreement with that. Right, but well before the assembly passed. I mean, you were well. I, I've always been you wanted a critic a of the uh, of the testing regime, particularly. Um, so, the this whole issue of testing, you know, testing is not always objective. Uh, what we know from social science research is that if you want to prove a point, you have to control for all the various factors that will influence that. So, and there's statistical methodology and computer methodology to do it. You can't just have a baseline testing and say, oh, well, this kid is at 50 and therefore the, the, the child went to 60 and therefore that's an improvement. Uh, there are too many factors. It, you have home factors. You have uh, what do you do with the teacher, for example, who's in a poor district and several of the students get removed from the class because of involvement with the criminal law. There, there's just mm -hmm. so many different factors. In fact, one superintendent from a very high-performing district made the point that our teachers are all going to have pretty good test scores because that's the family backgrounds that the students are coming from. That doesn't necessarily mean that the teacher is the best teacher. You know, there's so many different factors. I know a story that, I mean, again, personally, um, this is a few years ago, but they were talking about New York City schools weren't that well. And it, I went to a Chabad person, but he was a public school teacher in the eighth grade. I mean, so he was teaching then, so I threw it out to him. I says, hey, your schools aren't doing so well. He says, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. He says, our schools really are doing well. But I'm telling you, I'll tell you examples. I have a few kids from the Latin America. They went away home for two years, and they didn't get any kind of education, surely not as good as you would get in New York City schools. They come back two years later. They don't even speak the language well, and they're supposed to take a test. Well, of course they're going to do terribly on the test. They just lost a few years, and you know, you just don't say, well, you're an immigrant. Again, other factors. You just came, and you came a few years from Latin America. Well, how is he supposed to know his English, you know, as well as another child? So he says, come on. He says, the kids who want to learn, you know, that are learning, are learning, I mean, but it drags it down, all these kind of immigrant Right, I mean, kids. In the, some individual kids in classroom A might have very difficult home environments that precludes them from studying effectively yeah. at home, whereas in classroom B, there's no students in that category, so it's difficult to do comparisons. Yeah, you can't no. cookie-cutter children. It's right. just not proper. We, we recently had a very a critical vote on the regents, and there were yes. four members up for re-election, essentially, and only three got reappointed, and the person for the third judicial district, Jan Dr. James Jackson, was the, I guess, to some extent, sacrificial, uh, uh, one, the one who got bounced from this. I don't know what he did wrong. I don't know why he seemed really qualified. Well, maybe, I think, with respect to Dr. Uh, Jackson, he was the principal of the North Colony School Right. High school had an excellent reputation, uh, and I think is extremely knowledgeable in his field. Uh, and uh, also in his defense, he got appointed to the regions right. um, because Joe Bowman got sick and he stepped. And in. he got appointed only in the last for a two-year term, mm -hmm. so he he wasn't really responsible for the decisions that led to the debacle of the implementation right. of the Common Core. So I, I do think one of the things about this is the, uh, there was a growing sentiment in mm -hmm. the members mm -hmm. of the legislature that the, there needed to be some change in the regions and one of the more senior members had a high person that was highly recommended and 
based on the interviews, the two chairs of the interview committee, Higher Education, Deborah Glick, and Kathy Nolan from Education, recommended this other individual. Judge Finn. Yes, okay. and as a result, uh, the the judge uh, Finn, who has body. No, no education. No, I mean she's a judge, but she has no involvement. Well, with the she's school a system. town justice. I mean, right. I don't, I don't give great credence to the fact that she's a town justice. She she was an attorney. She attended the University of Buffalo. Right, but she has no. She had been very involved in her school district, um, uh, Monticello, I think right. it was, Monticello. in yeah. trying to assist and develop uh, a program to deal with the issue of African-American males who were not succeeding in school and what the causes of that were and trying to overcome that problem. So, And was she successful? Apparently she made quite a difference. Okay. And also the other factor is it was felt that too many of the members of the regions were not from more rural areas uh, of the state. And, uh, Assemblywoman Gunther, Aileen Gunther, who's a member from that area, was a very strong advocate uh, for this particular candidate to be on the regions, and so... Well, there's another connection, and that is that uh, the Assembly Speaker has a home in Sullivan County, right near where this judge lives. <laughs> is that and, so? Yes. I have no idea where the Speaker has a house. I do, <laughs> and that's why... <laughs> so he apparently had known Judge Finn and uh, when this was brought to his attention, this was like a no-brainer. But she did, you know, there was an application deadline of January 31st, and they went through these interviews, and they had several to choose from, and they said none of these were... Well, uh, I'm, I what, was what, supporting you know, Dr. Jeffrey Lozman. Michael Lozman. Michael Lozman. Yeah. Jeffrey's his... his brother, yes. Right, correct. Sorry, Michael Lozman. I'm right. sorry. Uh, Michael Lozman lives in Colony. And uh, mm -hmm. he actually is, uh, runs an organization that restores Jewish cemeteries in Eastern Europe. But uh, Dr. Lozman, um, you know, would bring to the table at the regions the fact that the regions are also responsible for a professional licensure and being a dentist, that would be something he could contribute. However, there was another member of the regions fulfilling that role from Manhattan. But also, my, my support for Dr. Lozman was not based on whether or not he was a professional educator. I don't think that the regions should all be professional educators. Uh, certainly, uh, well-educated and dedicated individuals uh, such as Dr. Lozman would be good candidates to be on the region because they would bring a common sense perspective Somehow, it's, it's sometimes mm -hmm. it's important to get away from Ed speak and right. get into people speak, and I think uh, that's why, you know, having only professional educators on the regions uh, is probably not a good idea. But certainly, you need a mix. Mm -hmm. uh, Women's Equality Act is something that you're very much in totally favor of. Totally support all all ten points of it. Yeah, so. and that's been held up in the Senate because they only like nine of the ten. Well, and the assembly also, won't, and the assembly there are won't four, vote and they've also the watered division. down the language of four of the planks. So it's not as simple to say. They who? The Senate. Senate will water down. Okay. Four of the planks were watered down, and so I think the women members of the assembly felt that doing it piecemeal would not be very effective not only because of the, the abortion thing. because yeah. of the abortion issue, but because of the fact they were not happy with the language of the other bills. Okay. I think part of the thing with women's equality is that you don't want to have the legislation purely be symbolic. Uh, you want it to be really with effective. With teeth. And exactly. Some teeth, yeah. So, and on the on the abortion one, really the legislation simply codifies Roe versus Wade. Uh, so that in the event there was any change in the federal approach, right. New York would still adhere to that. But New York evidence. had a Roe v. Wade law before Roe v. Wade. Uh, New York had some 
uh, provisions relating to this, but not under the, Rock never, under the Rockefeller's administration. But they did not codify Roe versus Wade. That was yeah. never done in the state. So, what's the religious perspective on women's equality? Well, that's a whole big issue. We should have a whole show on that. <laughs> that actually, I mean, the Rebbe was very strong on it. And in, in many issues, the women are better than the men. And it's just different roles. It's just like equal, you know, that everybody does the same thing, of course, that the men have their role and the women are very important in what they do also. So um, many times I just say that, you know, that uh, you have the women and they're very strong in what they do. They had a conference at Congregation Beth Abraham Jacob and I got up and I said, you know, you're, they're saying, well, women, according to Jewish law, there are differences that there's the mechitza and the, only the man is the rabbi. Again, the man is the cantor and they're just trying to, to, to put a, a square peg in a round hole and it wasn't working. He says, you know, you're approaching it the wrong way. In many instances, and it was just then that there's the Lubavitch has a women convention once a year, and you have thousands of women that are on the forefront of principals in, our, in the school. We have Rachel Ruman as a principal in our day school here in Albany. The women have many speakers, that their motivation, and if anything, they have a leading role more than in other facets. So, Equality is a funny kind of word. You don't want to, they're not robots that everybody is the same. Kind of what we well, said well, in we, education. When we legislate, we're legislating for secular society and, and yeah, religious sure. practices, which, by the way, I've attended your you know, uh, services, uh, Chabad-run services myself. And so, obviously, we don't interfere with any of that. But, uh, yeah. you know, in the secular society... Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get a different perspective. Well, just, no, it's really an important. interesting, yeah. uh, certainly interesting. I mean, you yeah. talk about equal pay, I don't know all the other 10 issues on there, but surely there's nothing against, you know, a woman doing, doing the job. Or But, you know, in the older synagogues, even the, not just in Eastern Europe, but over here too, is that they had the balcony, the women were up in the balcony, and everyone, and people saying, well, they're closer to to Hashem, you know, that's why they're up in the balcony. But the real reason was they could look over and see if their husband was where he should be. <laughs> you know, my mother tells me, because we went to 770, which, you know, they do have a balcony. A lot of Orthodox synagogues do not, like, for example, Congregation Beth Abraham, they're just a, yeah. separ a separator. Separated by right. the so aisle. My, yeah. my mother was looking down in, in with the Lubach headquarters, there are thousands of men, and my mother afterward told my father, I found you. Hey, what are you spying on me from? A, yeah. You're the only one with a blue yarmulke. Everybody there has a black yarmulke. I can spy you from the top over That's there. That's funny. <laughs> I wanted to bring up the Empire State Film Tax Credit. Okay. Okay. Why was that necessary to do? Because there are a lot of people who were saying the Tonight Show with starring uh, Jimmy Fallon would have come here anyway. We gave them a tax credit. I, they... You know, are trying to they who? because the state okay. the governor okay there is a belief now that it's more I'm more familiar with the upstate ramifications a lot of movie production mm -hmm. uh, is being sent to smaller cities because they're less expensive. Mm -hmm. So Schenectady, Angelo Santa Barbara, one of my colleagues, was, was working hard to try and get the tax credit extended to Schenectady. They were going to build a movie studio down along the Mohawk River. That didn't, no, didn't get, get passed. No. Um, however, I believe they did do something for Syracuse in that regard. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think it's to encourage and make possible these production crews to be filming in smaller cities uh, so and they made a place behind beyond the pines or behind right the, in that's about schenectady yeah. and they made it in schenectady right. i guess and we've had a couple films done in albany yeah ironweed and well it way was back one when with will ferrell i think and oh one with angelina jolie well that was salt was yeah, with okay. angelina jolie and they had 
uh, a couple of other... Uh, oh, so uh, it's so much yeah, less yeah, expensive yeah, yeah. to film in Albany, though. I saw some of one of the chase scenes, and it didn't look like New York City to me. It looked like 787. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But there was one, uh, a movie with uh, Chris Christopherson and... Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, Barbara Streisand, I think it was, uh, called Rollover. And that was filmed at SUNY Albany and also at the well of the LOB well, because the, the marble in the, the well looked like Middle East and that's where it took <laughs> place. So. Well, the, 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 yeah, I could see that. <laughs> uh, it was supposedly designed for the Middle East, that structure. Yeah. But um, all tax credits are somewhat problematic. Even the governor's uh, tax commission, the Pataki... Um, the Pataki uh, McCall mm -hmm. Commission right. had an economic study done that uh, criticized the tax credits because the desired results are not always obtained. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe the commission actually recommended uh, less emphasis on tax credits, but for whatever reason, uh, New York State seems to be in love with them. I'm not such a fan. Not such a fan. No. Okay. What about uh, religious tax exemption? You had that on your website. A religious. It was just you had, it had some video that they. You that was the tax about. exempt churches legislation, I believe. That okay. I had. Oh, what about the uh, investment tax credit? Okay, so the investment tax credit. I had the Catholic. Um, uh, conference in today, and I will say exactly what I sure. told them, which is that if in a perfect world run by Phil Steck, we would have all kind of all kinds of revenue, and we would be able to fully fund our public schools, and then we could consider uh, this possibility. You know, I went to private school, my daughter went to private school, my son spent a little time in private school. And uh, so I'm not against private schools, right. but right now when the public schools are underfunded is not the time to be doing this because it's going to cost us revenue that we need to invest in our public schools. City of Schenectady, for example, that school district is in very bad shape, as are the urban school districts in all of upstate mm -hmm. New York. And I think my first responsibility is to the public sphere. Um, and uh, so... Uh, I until we can until we can fully fund the foundation aid that's supposed to be going to the city of Schenectady School right. District. I don't think we should be going off into the mm -hmm. uh, the private school tax credits. What did you think of the um, oh, what was it the uh, well? Did you have anything to say about the school investment tax credit? Well, the way I hear is also that public schools would also get some of the money. It's not, it, it wouldn't be, because people are not accustomed to donating to public schools, uh, there appears to be, based on the consensus among superintendents of schools, that while that is a, a good selling point to the legislation, as it were, uh, that it's not a realistic possibility for the public, for the uh, funding of public education. So they need to have more prayer for to get this. It's going to take a lot of prayers to get this so they done. Have a prayer for. Them. <laughs> so, uh, what else would you like to bring out to the audience that we haven't talked? Well, about? Well, we have. You know, I think one of the things that that I really think we need to do in the state is um, I agree with the governor that we need to keep the line on property tax, that we should have a property tax freeze. However, uh, the, the interesting thing about New York is that we are really the only state in the nation where the local governments mm -hmm. pay half of the state's cost of Medicaid. And what we need to do is have the state take over Medicaid, and that would enable us probably to have a 10-year property tax freeze. Uh, I, you know, the governor's plan of consolidation and all that, it's nice. The bill that we're uh, announcing at the press conference tomorrow is a uh, consolidation bill. It's consolidating all the health insurance programs of, of our municipalities and our school districts at the county level uh, because it is a tremendous opportunity for cost savings. 
But I really feel that the consolidation is not going to um, produce as well as it would be if the state took over Medicaid. Someone suggested to me that we consolidate the North Colony and South Colony school districts. I mean, these are giant school districts. They're, they're. I don't uh, think so. That that's kind of. I mean, it depends. Depends what your perspective is on giant. I mean, I come from the Brooklyn schools, so right. You look but, at you, you know. You but look for at up what's here, giant. you know. Let's just say that if there is a criticism of our colony schools, which are generally excellent, but if there is a criticism, it's that students often get lost in the numbers game. And uh, the, uh, I don't think the consolidation of those two already extremely large districts into one would really be very helpful. So. Well, um, it would cut down some administrative costs. You don't need two superintendents. You don't, you know. Yeah, okay. You don't need two superintendents. True. A couple of other things that a could A couple of other things at the administrative level. Yeah. You could consolidate the purchasing, for example, but... And the bus routes probably could be mm, maybe mm. a little bit streamlined. And but, but there's a lot that you could do. You could... There's some function in the school district that you could be taken over completely at the county level, such as purchasing right. and things of that nature. Sure. Many, many states have countywide school districts. So if we're going to talk about something as revolutionary as that, I, I think that would be something the state would have to legislate, sure. not try to provide tax rebate incentives for voters to vote against their local governments if they don't mm -hmm. agree to promote consolidation. I, I just, um, I, in my district, I don't think there's a lot of opportunities for consolidation. Okay, well. Uh, Mark, I think we're out of time, but it's, you know, we're gonna have to ask Phil back again when there's more legislation, so. We just give you the blessing. She keep on doing the good work. You you came like you say you with your uh, running start and your feet rolling over here, and things are doing a lot of good work, especially for a freshman. And you continue to do well, and with of course with good health. All the best. Thank yes. you, Rabbi Mark. Thank you. <laughs>